Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Williams. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S, that is, at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four. Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Radamic. Berto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today. We actually have two things to talk about. Specifically, the first thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to have a special guest on. She is a Houston activist, uh, a, a registered nurse, a founded member of Houston Rising, and also a member of Black Lives Matter. She's not with us quite yet, but she will be shortly. Look. There are a whole lot of things happening in this country right now. We are also going to be talking about health care for sale, health care for sale, your life for sale. And I, I, I ran across an article from the Kaiser Foundation, and it, 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 is, it is so important because, folks, what many of us do not understand, what many of us do not understand is, is the predicament that this country is in. Uh, you know, they make things seem like they're okay, but they're not. And what w our goal as part of Politics Done Right and many other times, our goal is to make things right. But we can only make things right if people really understand what's going wrong. And that is, that is the issue that we have many times. So what we do here is we try to I don't want to say educate because a whole lot of times that, that, has, that is condescending in nature. But we try to bring things forth in such a manner that people can see, well, you know, what's really been happening in our society is a society where we are misled. A society where the plutocracy must keep us at each other's throats if they are to succeed. A system that requires division. But, you know, without further ado, what I want to do is I want to bring on Candice Weber uh, because uh, uh, Candice is giving us some of her, her precious time with us right now. Candice Weber, how are you doing today? I'm good, Egberto. How are you? I am doing just fine. Candice, before, I, I want to, uh, this is, you, you have a national audience here, and we're talking about, we're going to be discussing a rather local problem, but this is a local problem that extends to every school district in the United States, from Colorado to New York, everywhere else. So why don't you first tell yeah. me a little bit about yourself, and then we're going to talk about what you're working on, what you've been really getting out there. Well, my name is Candace Weber. I am one of the lead organizers for Black Lives Matter Houston. Um, I'm also one of the founding members of Houston Rising. Um, and both of those organizations, we spend our time focused on bringing equity to the black and brown communities. Um, I work quite a bit with um, black women and children specifically and brown women as well. Um, because the disparities in our communities are very similar and they're, um, I, I mean, and at the risk of making an inflamed statement, these disparities will literally take out our black and brown communities. Um, so we, we are trying to fight the, the issues that hit us the heaviest in every way that we can, um, which brought me to joining a coalition of parents and students fighting to stop privatization in HISD. And this is, um, as you said, this is a national problem. Um, you look at Chicago, oh my goodness, you look at Chicago and what's happened to the public schools there, Detroit, what's happened to the public schools um, there. Um, it's, ha it's spreading to California. It is here in Texas. And the languaging that is being used by those who seek to privatize um, our schools 
it's it's very charismatic and very charming. And unfortunately, people are buying into it and they don't realize just what they've done to themselves, to the community and to their children until it's too late. So we're trying to get ahead of the messaging that's coming from Betsy DeVos and, you know, the right wing. Um, so people can really make informed decisions about what happens in their communities. Now, uh, Candice, this is, this is quite interesting because... Uh, Harris County, where Houston resides, uh, Houston resides. It's a pretty darn progressive community. We actually uh, cleaned up for all practical purposes in this last election. We also have a mayor who uh, is, for all practical purposes, a a Democrat. But as I understand it, right now there is some issues that he is actually supporting the uh, the pseudo privatization of our uh, our several of our schools tell me about that and tell me how th- that that seems very much at odds with what we believe especially who this mayor is it absolutely is at odds with what he says he is what he says he stands for um, and had it not been for diligent research and just steadfastness, we would, this would have caught us completely off guard. Um, right now, um, our mayor here in uh, Houston, Sylvester Turner, is looking to make a partnership with um, three notorious, notoriously wealthy um, Republicans and that have got a very long um, history of doing very bad things to communities. Um, one of them is... Uh, Stephanie Page. Stephanie Page is actually connected to Alex. She is one of their education specialists, and um, she pretty much specializes in privatizing schools. Um, another one is, you guys probably have heard of Cullen. It's old money. His name is uh, Corbin Robertson. This young man is actually a climate change denier. He is extraordinarily wealthy. He's actually a member of one of Houston's 10 wealthiest um, families. I think his uh, net worth is, worth is about $10 billion. Uh, he's a coal giant, and um, that's he's made family money off of coal and denying climate change. Um, the other young lady is named Trini Mendenhall. Um, she is also Republican, and um, she was the owner of the Fiesta Mart, which is a very large grocery chain here in um, Houston, Texas. She also owns some other property. Um, when we saw that he was positioning himself and the city to partner with these three individuals in particular, I mean, at first we were like, there's, there's no way he's doing this. So we did more research and more research and every stone that we upturn yes this is exactly what he's planning on doing it's very disheartening very disheartening now how would we explain that is he just falling into the same realm of the plutocracy as any other folks something that we don't really you know something that we've been fighting for a very long time um so i i'm going to be very honest with you i cannot for the life of me make sense of what he's thinking um i do not know why Sylvester Turner would even enter into the uh, situation when it comes to the privatization of schools because Houston is a very large city. Harris County is the third largest county in this country, and he's got plenty of work to do without being involved in in public education. This is outside of his skill set. So I, I really can't, I can't even begin to imagine why he would enter into this fight and i certainly cannot imagine why he would enter into this fight on the wrong side um there's a lot of money at play between the three of these individuals they have a lot of money just um corbin robertson himself like i said he you know is one of the wealthiest families in houston texas and to be one of the wealthiest families in houston texas that it takes a lot of money right you know so um I don't want to speculate on what Turner has to gain from this, but it leads me to believe that it, it, the gains are not community driven at all. And if he is doing things that are not in the best interest of our communities, 
Um, you know, then I, I have to ask another question. What are you doing and why are you doing it? Well, and I, I would love to hear his answers to that. Exactly. Well, what I am happy about is uh, one of the reasons I wanted you on is I was just uh, I saw a video of you on Facebook with a whole posse of people going through the community, people of all all classes, all fears going into the community and uh, trying to explain to folks exactly what's happening. Because like you said earlier, Candice, they use a very attractive language to make it seem like yes. these people are working in the benefit of the students when what we know, you know, there, there's something that I don't understand that folks don't, un, that do, that folks don't get. And that is you cannot have private education that is efficient. And the reason why is uh, pr the profit motive, even if it's a, if it's a nonprofit, the profit motive or the, the uh, comes out to be you pay teachers less um, you, you and you try right. to make a profit out of that. Now they claim this is a a, a um, right. nonprofit, but we also know right. it's a nonprofit. And I think if I read correctly, they are going to they are willing to give eighteen hundred dollars a year more per student in order to quasi privatize. Is that correct? Did I read that correctly? Yes, you're absolutely right. They are willing to give eighteen hundred dollars more per student. But here, here's the situation, and this is, you know, once again, let's go back to the attractiveness, mm -hmm. you know, how they use this language. You know, families, you know, poor people, they hear, they know that their kids are struggling in school. They see things like textbooks that are falling apart. Um, their classrooms are overcrowded. But, you know, the burden for um, families to come up with extra supplies and things like that because the school district can't provide them. They hear things like, we'll give an extra $1,800 for every student. And they think, okay, problem solved. Well, the reality of it is, is the admissions criteria to get into private schools is horribly unfair. They pretty much weed out what they consider the undesirable. Right. So that leaves our children who have special education needs. Um, they're undesirable because the cost of education for them, you know, it's, it's not profitable to educate a child with special needs that requires a, a, a nurse to come to school with them every single day, much right. like my grandchild. My grandchild has got a very bad seizure disorder, and at any moment she can have a seizure, so we have to have nursing care for her or, you know, a family member who's trained to take care of her 24-7. That's not profitable for private schools, so they will weed my grandbaby out. Mm -hmm. Children that have got what they say are um, behavioral issues, well, the problem with that is, is children that, poor children, people in poor communities, they face issues that other people don't face and they don't understand it. It's really hard for me as an adult to come to work with an empty stomach and be productive. So can you imagine what it must be like for a child that's 10 years old who hasn't eaten because their family doesn't have food to go to school, sit in a desk, be productive, follow the rules and all of that, just the hun hunger pains alone will drive them to act out. It doesn't account for those types of things. Those children become undesirable. They get labor labeled as behavior problems. They get weeded out of these schools. And now we've got all of these children who are weeded out of these private schools, these not-for-profit schools, they've taken the money out of public education. So now where do those kids go for education? They, the money is no longer there right. in public ed to educate these kids. Right. The money is no longer there for our special ed children. So what they're really doing is bleeding the public education system, and there is a lot of money in public education. Right. There is enough money in public education to educate all of our children. If wealthy people didn't look at this as a cash cow and they actually got their hands out of the cookie jar. Absolutely. So, and there's the money another, is there. There's another thing, another thing I want to add to that, Candice, and that is one of the other reasons they like to do the weeding out is so that when they get their performer reports, their performance reports, they can say, oh, look at how successful we are. But what they really did That's is they exactly cherry picked right. the kids that they wanted to educate. That's exactly right. Absol education does not belong in the private sphere at all because it, there's a private... It absolutely does not. It does not belong there. And I am very happy, Candice, that you are out there, one of the leaders of the fight out there 
to really put this issue in check. And I really wanted to get you out here and, and put more of this on air because I tell you what, I'm, I'm al we're also going to want to get you in the studio uh, with some, some reports on how things are going later, later on in the, as, as we go on with this uh, over the next few weeks. Because Certainly. I think this is an issue that needs to be covered. It's an issue that doesn't, it's not a sexy issue. You don't see it on ABC, CBS, and all these news channels all of the times because you know what? Yeah. The people that are doing well, they're, they're doing well, but the people that are held down are continued to, uh, continually held down. Uh, Candice, is there anything else uh, that you'd like to add to this before we go to the next segment? I really do appreciate you being here. I think if, if there's anything that I would like to say before I go, it would be that children are innocent. They are absolutely innocent. When we give them an opportunity, we take away the, the barriers to success, and we put them in environments that create and foster success. They create and foster affirming growth. All children do well. Now, what that what well looks like, it's relative to the individual because children are uniquely innocent. And so at this point, as adults, it is our responsibility. We have a duty to make sure that every child succeeds because if every child succeeds, they have the opportunity to be successful. We get that money back. We get that investment back tenfold. Now we've got children that are our engineers, our lawyers, our doctors, our nurses, you know, or our hairdressers, whatever it may be, whether it be they want to go on for an education in um, university or they want to go to a trade school, but they all have an opportunity to gain something that they can be proud of. And if we can give that to every single child, then we are ultimately giving our country the keys to success and a pathway, a clear pathway into the future. So when, when we start talking about education, whether your child goes to a magnet school whether your child goes to a private school, whether your, whether your child goes to one of the schools that's facing closure right now and has been deemed unfit to provide education, your child is just as important as my child, and my child is just as important as yours. So we need to come together, our community, and make sure that they get what they need. And I also want to say, if Sylvester Turner is looking for partners in education, all he has to do is go into the community because the partnerships are there. They're there with the students, they're there with the teachers, and they're there with the parents. Those students, those teachers, and those parents are 100% ready and geared up to partner with HISD to provide an education that is worthy of every one of our children. So, Edward, so thank you very much for an opportunity to just get that out. I really appreciate it. That could it. not be said any better, Candice. And beforehand, how can folks, in first of all, two, I want, I want you to give two answers here. One, how can folks in Houston help you and others working on this issue do something about it? And number two, uh, this is a nationwide problems, problem. Give some advice to our national audience. Um, so... First, to the national audience, I would say get involved. Um, there is a gentleman, his name is G2 Brown. That's J-I-T-U Brown, like the color B-R-O-W-N. This, this young man is a warrior. He is a true soldier. Um, look him up. Um, just it's a quick Google search and see what this man is doing and where he's come from. This man actually went on a hunger strike to save schools. There is dedication there. Um, and he's got great ideas and great, um, a great path. Um, so definitely look into G2 Brown. I would say don't believe anything. Research everything. Re even the words that come out of my mouth. Research it. Look for yourself and do not be guided by politicians. Talk to school teachers. Talk to students. Those are the people that are going to give you a real picture of what education looks like in your community. Um, as far as what's going on on a local level, um, oh, we just lost Candice. Uh, we just lost Candice. Uh, her, her phone just uh, dropped off. But anyhow, um, let me tell you what she is doing 
in the community uh, right now is what I saw on Facebook. She got a whole bunch. Remember, po- the, the political season is over. The political season is over. And I saw Candace with a posse walking in the neighborhoods where these schools are going to be affected. That is what we all have to do around this country in whatever, I- in wh- whatever area that, um, that occurs. That is something that we have to do. We have to be a part of the solution. It's not going to be passive. You know, when it comes to education, a whole lot of times we forget. We forget about it. It's not sexy. It's high school education. It's middle school education. It's elementary education. And like we've spoken several times on many shows, and I want to carry this, uh, carry this a bit further. Like we've spoken about many times on many shows. You know what I want? I, I want to stay on education for for a, uh, for a bit longer, but whatever. I, I changed the image in the background, but I I need to stay on education here. We are in a country. We're uh, my show yesterday was about capitalism and what it is doing, the the type of capitalism we're practicing and what it is doing to the country. We are attempting to capitalize everything. And there are just simply parts of our society that does not, do not belong in the private sector. It simply does not belong there. And the reason why is a profit motive is actually a hindrance to what you're getting. If you have a public school, all your tax dollars allocated to public schools go into teaching, go into books, go into all these other areas. If you are talking, however, about a for-profit school, it means that a piece of those taxes that are there go into the pockets of investors into that entity. Well, folks are going to tell you later on, but wait a minute, we are speaking about uh, nonprofits. Forget that. The reality is mon- r- uh, nonprofits are run by executives of, as well. Very highly paid executives, more so than the teachers who are doing the job. If you doubt it, take a look at the nonprofit, the, the Red Cross, and all these other guys, and check out what the administrators of these things of money that you give freely, what they make. Education folks belong in the public sector. If you ever hear somebody talking about uh, charter schools, if you ever hear anybody talks about privatizing schools, they do not have your kids' interests at hand. They have a profit motive to put some money in the pockets of a few. And they market that. Remember, capitalism means marketing a product to make it pleasing to you to buy. And they have turned education. They have turned healthcare. They have turned everything into a product. And in doing so, attempting to market it in such a manner that it seems appealing to you, but the results are definitely, most of the times, bad. That's why we have bad health care in this country compared to any other industrialized country in the world. That's why our education system, meaning the uh, uh, primary care, uh, middle care, and, and in all these different areas are going down the drain. And it only does well in areas where people have money because even the way the government has been allocating resources, it is very dependent on where the area is as opposed to saying healthcare, public domain, education, public domain, and all the issues necessary or all the things that are necessary to keep a basic standard of life where it belongs in the public space. But anytime somebody tries to get to put this out, we have the marketers out there and we have the flamers out there trying to make you look like you're some sort of a communist who wants to know. Let's not go there. But folks, we have we're going to continue with the show today. The title of the show. Thank you so kindly, Candice Weber. First of all, thank you for what you're doing. Please keep it up. And folks, look her up. Her uh, Twitter handle was on the screen. It's as far if you want to reach and find out how you can be of assistance yourself. But anyhow, title of the show today was also our healthcare system is a disgrace. And these stories prove it. Subtitle, we are at a breaking point 
It is important that we get these stories out to help those indoctrinated by fear. I uh, will support the new health care system, single payer, Medicare for all. It is shameful that the corporatocracy is making it clear more and more every day that unless we pay, we are sentenced to death. I repeat that. Unless we pay, unless we allow ourselves to be extorted, we sentence, they have sentenced you, not we sentence, they have sentenced you to death. Their extortion is done with clever words and a modicum of class that allows many to see it as just a financial issue that we must live with instead of the evil that it really represents from an extractive economic system. It is up to us to reveal stories and expose them for what they are. It is our job. It is the goal of Politics Done Right. It is the goal of several other of these types of programs not to allow, not to allow those who have their foundational document, the Powell Manifesto, as the lead, as a tenets, based on the tenets that they follow. It is our job because, folks, the marketing, the marketing by, the marketing by by the, these, the, by the corporatocracy, the marketing by the unfettered capitalists is great. And they're good at making others seem so out of scope. But we have to challenge that. We have to challenge that. We have to educate ourselves. But folks, do you know what time it is? It's not my blog of the week. It's a piece that I got from Kaiser that I want to read bits and pieces as I enumerate what they're talking about. So folks, do you know what time it is? It's time for the weekly blog post. Okay, folks, the title of this thing from Kaiser was written by uh, Jonelle Alicia. No cash, no heart, transplant centers require proof of payment. And I covered a similar story a few weeks ago, similar to this, but this one broke my heart. Check this out. When Patrick Mannion heard about the Michigan woman denied a heart transplant because she couldn't afford the anti-rejection drugs, he knew what she was up against. On social media posts of a letter that went viral last month, and I printed that, Hida Martin, 60, of Grand Rapids, was informed that she was not a candidate for a heart transplant because of her finances. In other words... She couldn't get a heart, not because it, she didn't need it. She couldn't afford to have a heart. She couldn't afford it. And therefore, to, uh, uh, it recommended that she had a fundraiser for $10,000. Folks like to talk about, oh, my God, you know, you, you, you know it, it, it costs money to do these things and you know, uh, if we went to Medicare for all, it's going to cost so much more money. That woman raising $10,000 is asking, she is asking good people around the country to pay a tax. That donation to her can be considered a tax. So all the benevolent people that are going to send her money so that she'll have enough money in the bank that they will afford her a transplant, it's just a tax on them. It's just a tax on them. Anyhow, two years ago, Mannion of Oxford, Connecticut, learned he needed a double lung transplant after contracting idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, a progressive, a fatal disease. From the start, hospital officials told him to set aside $30,000 in a separate bank account to cover the cost. Mannion, 59, who received his lungs in May 2017, reflected, here you are. You, you need a heart. That's a tough road for any person, he said. And then for that person to have to be a fundraiser? Where is the heart in that? Where is the, where is the shame that our system has for putting people through this? It's not a smoker. He didn't do this onto himself. He just got the lucky key in his DNA that caused him to live 
or have that disease. None of us, none of us know exactly what we're going to have. Hell, you have smokers that have smoked two packs a day and never had a problem. And those that have smoked one cigarette and have lung cancer, no cigarettes and have lung cancer. So people saying, oh, behavior is an issue. Yes, behavior can be a big issue, but behavior is not a reason to deny people health care. It is not a reason that we don't have a national health care system, a national pool that says this is the this is the American pool. This is what it's going to cost America. Martin's case sparked outrage over a transplant system that links access to a life saving treatment to finances. Yes, it's evil. But requiring proof of payment for organ transplant and post-operative care is common, transplant experts say. And remember I said earlier, what they try to do is they make it look like there's a real reason to do this. And they make it look a bit antiseptic. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not an evil thing. There's a reason we have to do this. It happens every day, said Arthur Kaplan, bioethicist at the New York University Langone Medical Center. You get what I call a wallet biopsy a wallet biopsy. Virtually all of the nation's more than 250 transplant centers, which refer patients to a single national registry, require patients to verify how they will cover bills that can total $400,000 for a kidney transplant. It shouldn't even cost that. Uh, or $1.3 million for heart, plus monthly costs that average about $2,500 for anti-rejection drugs that must be taken for life. Kaplan said coverage for the drugs is more scattershot than for the operation itself, even though transplanted organs will not last without the medicine. Does make any sense. Okay? For Morton, the social media attention helped. Within days, she had raised more than $30,000 through a GoFundMe account, and officials at Spectrum Health confirmed she was added to the transplant list. Wow. You raise $30,000 and you get to the transplant list. Let me tell you something about marketing, right? Uh, if you have the looks, and this is going to sound terrible, but it's the truth about marketing. If you have a certain look, you can raise $30,000 by saying, oh, you are sick. But if you look some other way, it can be that much more difficult for you to raise that money because again unfortunately that's the society that we live in right uh i've done all kinds of experiments with giving and uh, with, with folks uh given i've done all kinds of experiments on facebook where we have a b comparisons what you use as your lead what you use as a photograph that you put in in um in references etc and you would be surprised what it tells you so we have to educate folks on knowing that it is not enough to just say, go raise $30,000. You know, somebody that has the right bona fides, or they'll raise it because folks are going to normally be empathetic towards them. Other people, they just aren't so empathetic towards them. I've even noticed that in broadcasting. I can tell you stories that have occurred at all these other areas where we do things. So folks... Until we create a truly equitable society, what happens is never equitable, and we have to have external, external forces to work on those. Anyhow, the ability to pay for post-transplant care and lifelong immunosuppression medications is essential to increase the likelihood of a successful transplant and longevity of the transplant recipient, officials say. You hear that antiseptic answer? In other words... We have to make sure that after we give them that organ, that organ is going to last. Come on. You know, I mean, if we give it to somebody and they don't have the wherewithal to take the right kind of drugs and all that kind of stuff, then that organ is, is wasted on that person because, you know, they didn't take care of it. First of all, we ought to realize that all those organs that they got were received free of charge. Nobody paid for the organs. Somebody died and gave them an organ. So these guys make money on all, all parts. They get the organ free. They inflate the cost of the organ, and then they inflate the cost of the procedures, and then they, they suck you for the rest of your life for anti-rejection drugs. That is 
that is a business. When we talk about earlier, we had the school talk about where profits don't belong. Do you think those anti-rejection drugs really cost $2,500 a month? That is sick. We'll talk about that a little later. We'll talk about that evilness a little bit later. Continuing. In the most pragmatic light that, uh, light, that makes sense. More than 140, and notice how the author said it, in the most pragmatic light. In other words, hey, if you, if you really want to be a pragmatist, if you have person A who can uh, buy the drugs and person B who can buy the drugs and there's a scarcity of organs, then you're going to limit uh, that organ to person that has the wherewithal to do so, right? That is how we sell, sell things in the free markets, right? In, the, in a capitalist market. You know, we, we, we give it to the best option because there's scarcity. In healthcare, that shouldn't be the case at all. That person who receives that organ should have a complex around them to sustain that thing. But we don't think like that, right? That organ had just, when that organ came out of that dead person, it just became another product, another capitalist product to make a profit off of. That transplant became a profit center. We get a free organ. We monetize and capitalize that organ, which is now going to make a whole lot of rich people who own drug companies, who own uh, hospitals, who own equipment delivery companies, they are going to be commoditized on that human being, uh, that living human being, and that dead human being who provided the organ. It is a lot more evil than one would take it, but we know how to make it pretty. Here it goes. Uh, in the most pragmatic light, that makes sense. More than 114,000 people are waiting for organs in the United States and fewer than 35,000 35, organs were transplanted last year, according to the United Network Organs. Well, here's the, here's the kicker. There are a lot of dead people, and this sounds macabre, but there are a lot of dead people dying. Most of them not donating organs, right? Most of them not doing things. We could, as a society, have a real humane nonprofit industry that harvests all organs, right? We could make it into the psyche that those people whose loved ones are given organs are paid. People say, oh, well, there is some moral, there's some morality behind that. And uh, some people would start talking about selling organs. Well, they are doing, people are selling organs. It's just not the people who own the organs that are selling them. It's the doctors, uh, not the doctors, it's the corporations that are selling organs. They are. They are selling organs. So when they talk about, we don't want to start paying people for organs because somehow what's going to happen is it's going to become a business. It is a business. The only problem is that the people who's who the families that are given organs, they are not profiting from it. Everybody else is. Everybody else in the capitalist structure is profiting from these organs. But the folks who the, the, the folks who are hurting, the folks who are given these aren't. You see, it's all how things are marketed. They market these organs. When you donate blood for a, for those who donate blood for free, right? They don't say every, every pint of blood that's being sold for two or three or four hundred dollars. Why not give the person giving the blood fifty dollars? You want to see, you know, but you know what? They don't want to do that because it affects the structure. It affects, it affects the margins. Believe nothing they tell you. They capitalize everything. They make everything into a product. They build a system around it and they profit from it and you get screwed. Even the drugs. We pay for the drugs. Only when the drugs seem to be in the position of being successful does it get transferred to the private sector and then the private sector makes the money off of it and all the money invested by the NIH is the year, what you paid for, the taxpayers' dollars. It doesn't get, you know, the profits from all those big drugs that don't cost $2,500 for these transplant patients. You don't get any of that. The government, which should be a partner in the whatever the profit margins are, they don't get it. And why don't the politicians fight for it? Because they're bought. 
we are trying here to educate, to highlight, and to, to give people the truth of what's happening in the society. So that then, when they start asking politicians or bringing new politicians into the fold, they come into the fold with a different frame of mind. They don't come in with the lies. They don't come in with the, the modus operandi. They don't come in with this is how things have always worked. They said this is how things should work. These are the changes we will make. These are the things we will do. Do you hear this about organs on TV, on MSNBC, CBS, ABC, CBS, and all these other stations? No, why not? Because Nobody wants to know that the masses are, you know, we are like reaped. We are like the, the, the free growing trees that produce fruit. That's who we are. Okay, continuing. If you, if you are receiving a life saving organ, you have to be able to afford it, said Kelly Green, executive director of Hope Help Hope Live, the Pennsylvania organization that has helped Mannion. His friends and family have rallied, flocking to fundraisers and raging and, and range from hair salon cutathons to golf tournaments, raising nearly one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars so far for transplant related care. Does that make any sense that you have to be running around the country trying to beg people for money to survive, to live? Allowing financial factors to determine who gets a spot on the waiting list strikes many as unfair, Kaplan said. It may be a source of anger because when we're looking for organs, we don't like to think that they go to the rich, he said. In reality, it's largely true. The organs go to the rich. Nearly half of the patients waiting for organs in the U.S. have private health insurance. UNOS data show the rest are largely covered by the government, including Medicaid, the federal program for the disabled and poor, and Medicare. Medicare also covers kidney transplant for all patients with end-stage renal disease, but there is a catch. While the cost of a kidney transplant is covered for people younger than 65, the program halts payment for anti-rejection drugs after 36 months. Does that make any sense? Hell no. That leaves many patients facing sudden bills, said Tanya Safer, vice president of health policy for the National Foundation, uh, Kidney Foundation. Legislation that would extend Medicare coverage for those uh, drugs has been stalled for years. For Alex Reed, 28, of Pittsburgh, who received a kidney transplant three years ago, coverage of for a dozen medication he takes ended November 30th. His mother, Bobby Reed, 62, has been scrambling for a solution. We can't pick up those costs, said Reed, whose family runs the independent insurance firm. It would be at least $3,000 or $4,000 a month for drugs that cost pennies to make people and drugs that you likely paid for with your tax dollars for the initial investment to bring it to fruition. Prices of, for drugs, which include powerful medications that prevent the body from rejecting the organs, have been falling in recent years as more generic versions have come to market. But the cost can still be hard on a budget. It's, you know, this is a way for you to never be able to be self-sufficient, self right? Because all of us can get sick, and the people who profit from sickness are the big corporations, right? So all of us, are th so they absorb everything. They, uh, they, they absorb everything. You get sick, you get, they, they absorb it. They find a way to, to, to monetize that. You need an education, they try to find a way to monetize that. Right? Everything monetized. Folks, it doesn't have to be that way. It isn't this way in most countries most of our developed countries where people are much happier, where people don't have these things to worry about. It, isn't, it doesn't have to be that way. And you can't fall for the trap that as soon as we're looking for real solution, they, de they deem you a communist or something like that. I don't see them calling Sweden, Norway, Denmark, or all these places. And don't believe any of the things they talk about. Oh, well, they are smaller. Oh, well, they, they are more homogeneous. None of that really matters. Everything scales. Everything scales. And in fact, if, if they want to be truthful, the more people you have in a system, uh, in general, in the aggregate, the more efficient it can be. Do not buy into the fallacies or the lies. 
GoFundMe efforts have become a popular way for sick people to raise money about a third of the campaigns. Well, th I don't want to read this part too keenly because what they're saying there is uh, the, at that point of the article, they started to go into um, the er areas of GoFundMe and how that works. And because GoFundMe, you can use the money for anything as opposed to some other areas where the money is really just dedicated to the to the uh, cost of your surgery. I mean, I, I am in. Uh, I'm agree. Look, if you're if you're raising if you're using a GoFundMe for a particular purpose, please, then that's what that GoFundMe should be used for. Of course, every now and then you find some cheaters in the, in in the fold, but for the most part, you know, I I I have been I have been very happy to know that most people are in fact good people. Most people are in fact. Good people. So what I want to do now, folks, is as follows. Um, what 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 I want to do is as follows. Uh, first of all, turn down the volume on my uh, phone so that I can start reading it. Jeff McKinley, welcome aboard. Uh, I'm going to start reading. So uh, before I read these, I need to get to my folks to let them know about um, that this is a progressive show, of course, that needs your support. So what I want to ask those of you who are listening to the show right now is uh, consider going to patreon.com. That is how we survive. Please go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash politics done right. Become a subscriber or a donor to the show, Politics Done Right. We more than ever need your support. We need to have you on board. If we are to, to continue to provide these stories and provide this context and narratives to our people to ensure that they understand and that they do not fall prey to what the Powell Manifesto has been teaching them for the last 40 plus years, as far as, or even more, probably 50 years, as far as how to screw themselves, as far as how to make things better for others, but not for themselves, for not for the American society, but just for the American plutocracy. We can't hear this from the mainstream media in detail because they are in fact funded by these same people. Some some uh, print reporters, they really try. A lot of the material we get is from very good print reporting that we also need to support. Buy your newspaper, buy these, uh, some of these reporters who have their own online reporting. And, of course, Politics Done Right, that we try to put a whole lot of this together and put it out there. And we are out there in the field as well, watching the activists in action. We are activists ourselves. We go out there to different conferences to make a difference, but we need your support. So, please go ahead and go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, slash politics done right, where we are making a difference. We are making a difference. You are making a difference. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, slash politics done right. Anyhow, continuing now with the questions. Jeff McKinley. I remember Jeff from being, I think, a long time ago, long time listener. I think Jeff, if I recall, is a libertarian. But anyhow, government through regulations has completely bastardized the concept of insurance. What we have today is not insurance. It is a prepayment plan. And a prepayment plan, let's see, I don't quite get that. It's a prepayment plan. And all of the mandated coverage the cartels within the states for insurance companies' plans or a whole slew of other meddling, and you uh, have the mess that we have today. Government is the poison. We need much less intervention and allow markets to work. <sighs> markets do not work in healthcare. I have illustrated, enumerated the reasons why healthcare is not a market. Market, ha people have free choices in markets. With healthcare, you don't choose to get sick or when you get sick or if you can get sick and therefore markets do not belong there. You can't ask and then say, let me choose a plan when I get sick or if you've chosen the wrong plan, you die. Assigning markets to health care is inhumane, immoral, and evil. Because again, you are assigning the market to control whether you live or die. In other words, you are worshiping a new God, the market. Market works fine if you want to buy a car, you have a selection of cars, if you want to buy a vacuum cleaner, if you want to buy certain, thing, certain things, it's great to be in the market because you get a variety and all this stuff is great. But one of the other ways we can prove that markets don't work 
in healthcare is most of the drugs that are coming out, most of the drugs that are developed, except for these ripoffs that we have where people uh, try to put a new ingredient in a drug and, and get a new patent for another 17 years or so, are developed whom by whom? Your tax dollars. Market simply, markets simply do not work in healthcare and it does not work in education. We have to learn that, and, and most of what we do here is try to explain why. We don't just want to tell you markets don't work in these fields. We want to tell you why. In education, it's because uh, that profit that has to go to that uh, investor has to come from somewhere else. Don't be fooled at all, folks. Do not be fooled at all. That is what they want, and that is what we cannot allow them to have we cannot allow that we simply cannot allow that okay i uh, welcome aboard richenda davis bates uh, uh let's say michael rodnan the problem with our healthcare system isn't government it's the profit motive absolutely so the profit motive when you have healthcare costs growing at 7% or whatever percentage above the percentage of inflation and above the baby boomer explosion, and that's a different uh, story. It just means greed. And yesterday I explained a whole lot of that. If you have to have a certain amount of growth in a, in, in a system that really doesn't have to grow, then the only way you can get growth is increasing prices. You're not increasing services. You're not increasing value. You're just increasing prices. That is why it doesn't work. Uh, Michael Rodney, this is a difficult topic to talk about. Impoverished people sometimes sell their organs on an international gray market. So it's true. Kidney, liver, bone marrow. The reason that the, the kidney, kidney and liver and bone marrow are easily sold because, again, you can sell one of your kidneys. You can sell a piece of your liver. You can sell some of your marrow. So those are reproducible. Well, the kidney not reproducible, but you have two. The liver regenerates and the marrow grows back. So, I mean, those are, you're right about that. Vice News covered this black market in 2015. I don't recall seeing that one, um, that particular uh, one, but I know that, um, that they've covered quite a bit of these types of issues. But, folks, it is such an immoral thing that, that uh, you know, it, you, you wonder, you wonder how people, how people can really uh, continue to support this. And one of the reasons, they do support these uh, these things. Again, like I mentioned when I was talking to Candice, is it is very, very well marketed. And that is what we do with products. And that is why uh, our capital structure loves to create or, or make everything into a product. Because you make it into a product and then you create a marketing campaign around it. And even transplants, if you take or uh, we've created a hell of a marketing campaign around cancer. We have these very private hospitals that are that they specialize in cancer and they, they, they show on TV uh, how great cancer is. You go in with your cancer and you sit down and you're treated well. You're getting coffee and donuts and they look at you and they, they, they make a specific plan specific to you, et cetera, et cetera. I would love to see them compare their outcomes with the, the, the hospitals at large because, folks, like I tell you, when you make health care, when you make health care, a product. Nothing good comes out of it. We have to get over it. We have to preach this. We have to preach that the only solution in America today is a Medicare for all, a single payer Medicare for all. Now, I want to qualify something because this is an issue that came up on Tom Hartman. Uh, a woman called and said, I don't know if I like Medicare for all because if it's Medicare for all, it means we still have that 20% uh, that 20% that we have to pay plus uh, a deductible, etc. Medicare for all is just a catch-all phrase. Medicare for all means everybody has health care. Nobody pays any uh, any pre, what is it called? Nobody pays, there no 20%. Nobody pays for these drugs as they speak about or anything like that. All health care comes out of general taxes, which means it's a progressive tax. If you pay, if you make a little, you pay a little. If you make a lot, you pay a lot. It's that simple. And it's 100% fair for that. If you make a lot of money, this country gave you the wherewithal to do so. Don't ever sit back and think you did it on your own. Don't you ever sit back and think you did it on your own. 
when I, I when I formed my company and I had all these products, I've I've listed a whole bunch of showed the amount of products that I've that I've made over the last 30 years, and there are quite a few products. I never ever once, even before I became a, a full-time political activist, never once sat down there and thought that that was just my being. I've always been grateful to a society that gave me the wherewithal to be able to do what I did. And until we, w and that is what we have to sell. We have to get out of selling the individualism and start selling the, 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 the collectivism because it's we as a collective that can accomplish something. No individual can survive. That one person that, that revels in his money cannot survive without us all. He cannot, she cannot survive. So therefore, if, 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 you are give, if you are in some field that affords you a huge amount of money, we expect quite a bit back. That's the only way the system survives. And remember again, it's not you who did it all by your lonesome. We're getting to the end of the program. One more time, I'd like to ask those of you that are listening to please consider going to patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash politics done right and become a subscriber or a donor to the show. Uh, if you can go to politicsdoneright.com and go to, the, to our PayPal if you want to be a donor, or you can go to patreon.com slash politicsdoneright if you want to be a subscriber. We need your support. We appreciate your support. We, uh, we intend to continue doing this and making sure that we inform Americans about their worth, their rights, and what can be. My name is Egberto Willies. This is Politics Done Right, and you know how I close this baby. I am out. <laughs>